I don't know what's causing it. We have a synth, you know, it's like an under, under my voice thing. That's what it's got to be. I could just start talking, but that would be weird. So this might, you know, be weirder for me to stand, but. Bro, twice? <laughs> oh my gosh. Uh, we're going to include that in the YouTube video. Michael, make sure that all gets cut in. I want people to see that. Anyway, uh, sorry. Um, where was I? Oh yeah. Here's a weird thing for me. Um, I never really thought I would feel at home anywhere else than my home state. I, I think, again, most of y'all know by now, I didn't grow up in Alabama. I wasn't born in Tuscaloosa. This is a, a new city for me. And in fact, this is the only other state I've ever lived in besides Kentucky. Uh, and it, it's weird for me to say this, but it feels like home. Um, I, I love it here. And, and it's odd because I, I seriously, like, um, the memories that I have of my childhood and all that stuff uh, are great, but... But like when people ask me where home is now, I say Tuscaloosa. And, and the reason is because I feel like this is a really special place. Now, if you grew up here uh, or you're just a college student visiting out, you may not feel the same way. Maybe you're, you're numb to it too or bored with it. Um, but God is doing some really unique things in Tuscaloosa, and I get to see unique things. Um, and to watch my kids grow up here and to experience what this community has to offer uh, has been awesome. And uh, I think that's why I love For Tuscaloosa Month so much. You know, in years, in years past, we've called this Be Rich, and it has been our opportunity to, um, to be rich in good deeds, to, to reach out and make a massive difference in our community. We decided that because of, um, you know, our, the reality that we say we're for Tuscaloosa all the time, maybe it made more sense to call this month together for Tuscaloosa, and so that's what we decided to do. And all month long, all month long, through generosity and service and uh, showing up and, you know, giving money and time and talents and treasure and all the stuff, you all are going to make Tuscaloosa an even better place to live. Um, and I love it because every single year you blow my mind with what you do. And every single year we pick bigger projects and I think, wow, that makes me really nervous. And then by the end of the month, they're all done and I'm going, wow, how did we do that? And the wow is, you know, it's you, don't get me wrong, but it's also, I think, if I might say, God working through you, that, that, that God's up to some really great things. You know, last week, we, I, I've been talking about this word ecclesia for a really long time, but last week I left you with this idea that, that we as followers of Jesus, when we, when we come together, the whole point of us being together is that, that we're supposed to be up to what he would have us be up to. And the way I said it was that the ecclesia of Jesus is the gathering of kingdom of God people, right? You are kingdom of God people. We live in this era of time after Jesus' resurrection, and he set up this kingdom. He bought and paid for this kingdom that we get to live in. We are kingdom of God people doing kingdom of God work in the world. That, that like because we live in this, this new life, this new world that, that God has bought and paid for for us, life is different. And the world is different. The way we should look at things is different. We get to experience the kingdom of God now. And uh, here's the hard part for us as Jesus followers that, that I didn't really get taught a lot when I was a kid. We get to be a, a part of bringing about more of the kingdom of God in everyone's lives around us every single day. You know, when, when you find yourself inspired by a group of people or inspired by a team or inspired by a club, you end up starting to wear the t-shirt, right? Or you start talking about it and you start inviting other people to be a part of it. The same thing happens when we come to realize that we live now in this new kingdom, that we have a king, that he is in charge and he bought it for us. And we want everybody to experience it. The best way, as I said last week, the best way for other people to see how much we love God the best way our love for God is demonstrated is by how we love each other, right? How we love our neighbor. How we as Christians treat other people and, and how they see that from us, that's how they're going to know. That's how they're going to know. And all this is inspired um, from a, a, just a, a, almost a, a simple phrase, uh, almost a throwaway phrase uh, in, in one respect. And if, in fact, if you, if you read 1 Timothy or any of the letters that Paul wrote, sometimes you, you see these phrases, you just gloss right over it. But, but don't miss the impact of what Paul was trying to tell Timothy. He said this, command those, right? Not like if they want to or, you know, maybe they could think about it or consider it. He said, command those who are rich in this present world. And that's all of us, by the way, because most of us in this room are not struggling to think of where our next meal will come from. And if that is where you are, right, if, you, if you're in a place where you know what you're going to eat for lunch today, then you are considered rich by the standards of our world. So command those who are rich in this present world to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. That there was supposed to be something about us as Jesus followers that, that put us in this posture of, we just want to make sure everyone has what they need. We want, we want to make a difference. We want to, we want to see if we can make the world a little bit better today than it was yesterday. It's a silly phrase from a 
dumb Disney movie, but every day when I drop my kids off for school, I say, are you ready to make the world a better place? If you know what that is, you win the Disney trivia poster for today, right? But, but I ask my kids that every day. Are you ready to make the world a better place? Uh, are you, you know, because if you're a Jesus follower and you really believe what you say you believe, well then, you know, you've got an opportunity. And I love it that, that our church has decided to be in a posture that we see this as an opportunity, not a burden. Right? Now, if you're new, you may not have figured that out yet, and this may feel like you know, kind of burdensome, but give us some time, I promise. As you live into this and you give God a chance to work through your faithfulness, as you give God a chance to, to work through you opening your wallet or opening your hands to service or both of those things, you're going to start to realize that this isn't really as burdensome as it sounds. In fact, when we come together, right, this is where this whole movement came from. When we say together for Tuscaloosa, this whole movement was spawned by the idea that we are so blessed when we allow ourselves to be a blessing, we are so, like, it, it changes something in us when we can see that we are making a difference. When we can take the gratitude we have for God and all the great stuff he's done for us, we can turn it around and, and share that with somebody else. It's such a big blessing. It's another way for us to continue to live into who we are as Jesus followers. And admittedly, like I said, I don't, I don't want to belabor this. I've said it a couple times now, but, but I didn't hear a lot of that growing up. No disrespect to any of my Sunday school teachers who I'm sure are listening right now um, or, or anyone else who taught me in my church as a kid and whatever, um, but, but we tend to feel like our relationship with Jesus is just about us or our relationship with God is just about us. But the truth is that when, when the church is firing on all cylinders, when the church is at its best, when the gathering, the ecclesia of Jesus is doing its absolute best, it's when we are demonstrating our love for God by the way we love each other and the way we love others outside of the church. Now, all of that to say, I want to ask you a question today, all right? This is what the month is about, right? The whole month, this month, is about generosity and sharing and, and extravagant. Every single year, I'm stunned by what you all do. But specifically today, we call this Give Sunday. And uh, Give Sunday is our opportunity where we take 100%, one, every single penny of what comes into our, our uh, Fort Tuscaloosa Fund all month long. We're going to give 100% of it away. And it's not just you all that are giving. You know, we've been sharing this on social media and people outside of our church are giving because it's a promise that whatever you give will go back to make our community a better place. And we're doing it in incredible ways this week. But, but, but just in case you don't quite understand why or, or, or maybe you're wrestling with what to do next, let me ask you a simple question. To what ends do you want your life to be a means? Uh, let that sink in for a second, okay? All of us have a life. And this gets a little bit to the purpose stuff we talked about and, and made for more over the past month. But, but think about this for a second. You know, all of our lives are driving in, in, in some direction. Um, <laughs> some of us may feel a little bit more aimless than others. Okay, I'll get that. But all of our, our lives are moving in one particular direction or another. So, so think about this. To what ends, like where, where do you want the means of your life, to where do you want the energy of your life, the, the direction of your life, the, the, the focus of your life, where do you want it to end up? Again, not to be super morbid or make you think about your own, you know, mortality or anything, but not all of us, we don't get to live forever in this world. Jesus offers his life eternal in heaven, but you get one life. And so what do you want that life to be about? What do you want that life to mean? What do you want the purpose and the center of that to be? And if you've never thought about that question, I'm giving you 20 minutes, right, right now to wrestle with it. Because every one of us should an answer this question. If you want to have a life of purpose, you want to have a life that actually, like, you know, you feel like it's fulfilling and it's con it brings you content and hope every single day, you need to wrestle with this question. To what ends do you want your life to be a means? Now, Jesus' disciples were wrestling with this very question. Uh, they didn't quite understand they were wrestling with it, but the whole town, the whole, you know, gathering in, in Judea, and, and specifically this happened around the Sea of Galilee, so this was early on in Jesus' ministry, they're wrestling with, what is this life really all about? What am I supposed to do? Where is it supposed to take me? And Jesus gave some of his hardest teaching. In fact, I'm going to read it to you, uh, and you're going to go, ugh, right? Because um, it's going to feel heavy. Now, don't panic. I'm going to break it down for you, and, and hopefully you'll get it to a place where you can process it and maybe put it into practice. But Jesus, he talked about money and means and life more than anything else that he talked about. In, in all of his teaching, he was really centered on this. And I think the reason why is because we're so tempted, we're so tempted not to answer the question, to just kind of, you know, bounce off things like ping pong balls until something sticks. Or my dad used to say, well, I don't understand what this means, but throw the spaghetti against the wall and see what sticks. Does people, th do you throw spaghetti against the wall? It's the strangest thing I've ever seen. I see nodding heads. You guys are crazy. Anyway, 
Like, I just feel like that's not a really great way to live, and I don't think Jesus felt that was a great way to live either. In fact, that's why I think he said what he said. So they're wrestling, and, and this is actually what's in, in the Sermon on the Mount. In the Sermon on the Mount, uh, which is Jesus' greatest teaching, it's, it's um, present in all the Gospels. It's really a, 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 a kind of a summary of everything that he tried to teach, and, and it's the best teaching we have from Jesus. And in the middle of it, there's this conversation about money that comes up, and, it, and it's actually a conversation about— um, uh, it, it comes off like it's all about money, but it's actually a, it's a conversation about purpose. And I'm going to read it to you, and then I'm going to try to explain it, okay? So this is what Jesus says, and, and everyone would have gasped when he said these things. So here we go. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. Now pause for a minute. Um, when you think about treasures on earth, you more than likely think about money, um, and you think about, you know, funds and and chances are, unless you're like one of my great-grandparents, uh, you don't bury your money in a mattress or in a box in the backyard or in a clay jar. So when you hear moths and vermin destroying, it sounds kind of weird because your money's just a number that a bank account sends you all the time. And I get that. But what, in Jesus' day, this was a very real problem. People would make money or gather coins or they would, you know, sell products and then they would have to bury it someplace or put it in a barn or put it in a shed. And then all of a sudden, you know, Things were eating it. <laughs> Literally, the paper money would get chewed up or it would mold away or, or someone would come in and break the clay jar and steal all the coins and there was no way to prove that it had happened, right? And so Jesus is like, don't, you know, you know better than to do that. You know better than to store up this money now and, and put it in a place where someone can take it. And so he goes on and he says this, but instead, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. I'll pause again, okay? Me growing up, one of the things that I thought when I read this passage was that it meant like every time I did something good, that there was some sort of jar that got put in heaven with money in it for me. Um, that is not what Jesus is saying, okay? Not at all what Jesus is saying. And this is not about like earning another, you know, uh, ruby in your crown or something, okay? So just get all that imagery out of your head for a second, clean slate, and listen to what Jesus is saying. Store up for, your treasures in, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moss and vermins do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. And then he says this interesting sentence, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. There's two different things going on in this passage. This is really one I want you to get the heart of. We could talk about the Sermon on the Mount all day. I don't have time for that. You don't have time for that. But the two things I want you to take away from what Jesus is saying are this. Number one, you... With all of your actions and all of your, um, your achievement and all the things you're doing, you're, you are gathering for yourselves equity, right? And maybe it's physical equity. Maybe it's money that you've, you, you've, you've been a successful business person and, and you've been able to gather this equity to yourself. You've been able to gather these treasures to yourself, right? Um, and it's, it's yours and it's sitting here, right? And you have the opportunity to keep it and stuff it away uh, and hold it for a rainy day that may or may not ever come. Or, Jesus says, you can turn that into kingdom equity, you can turn that into kingdom change. You can turn that into treasure that's actually stored up in heaven. And here's how you do that, by the way. This is what I want you to think about. When you give, right, when you, when you decide to be generous, right, when, when you decide, okay, God, everything that I have is yours anyway. Every dime I've ever received has been given to me because it came from you first. And I'm going to open up my hands and I'm going to open up my wallet. I'm going to trust you with my finances. What ends up happening is that those resources, right, they go into God's hands. They come into the church, and then God multiplies them 10, 20, 1,000 fold. And then one day what you realize is that people find Jesus, and people are inspired to find Jesus, and people find themselves moving from being lost into found, and people find themselves being, you know, being, from being broken into whole. And then one day there's, they're, they're in heaven, and you see them there. Jesus is saying that you have this opportunity to invest in kingdom work that has eternal consequences eternal change this is why i mean if i, I don't want to i'm not gonna call anybody out but some of the most generous people in this room the reason they're so generous is because they get this so well it's not a braggy thing right and in fact if, if i called their names out they'd probably punch me on the way out the door as loving as kind as they are because it's not about them what they realize is that god has given them this opportunity to be a part of something bigger than themselves and jesus is given us this challenge this opportunity to say hey you know what you can you can store up for yourself things here that you can't take with you when you leave, or you can be a part of what God is up to in the world, and you can see those results forever. That's, that's really part one. Part two, is, part two is, when you're a part of what God is up to, when you're a part of what God's up to, it actually, back up for me, please. Back up for me, one slide, wait for it. It's all right. There it is. When you're a part of what God's up to, 
your heart is in the right place. Your heart is in the right place. Now, look, I know that you may think for yourself, well, I got a good head on my shoulders, and, and uh, I, you know, I, I, I've got direction and purpose in my life. But all of us have experienced times of, of inner conflict where we feel like we don't quite know what the right thing is to do, or we feel like there might be a thing to do, but it makes us nervous, and we don't know what we're going to feel when we get there. And what Jesus is promising is that when we open ourselves, like open our, our, our time and our talent and our treasure, and we lay those things that cost us so much, we lay them on the table for him, the contentment that comes from our heart being in the right place makes our lives better. And, bonus, you get to make other people's lives better too. It's this amazing circle and this amazing cycle. And I think the reason Jesus talked about this so much is because this is probably the number one thing we're most hesitant about. In fact, for those of you that aren't really, you didn't grow up in church, or maybe you're sitting here and you're pretty cynical about everything that I'm saying, the reason you're so cynical about what I'm saying is because you have come up with the thought that the church just wants your money. And I want to own that, okay? That, that it's really easy to perceive that, that we're all just about money. <laughs> uh, I, most of the people who've been at this church long enough can know I rarely talk about this. All right, this is one time a year that I bring this up, and the reason I bring it up is because it's so hard for us to get our heads wrapped around. It's so hard for us to get our heads wrapped around that God doesn't want your money. God already has your money. God gave it to you. He laid it at your feet. Everything you have, every blessing you have came from him in the first place. He doesn't want your money. He wants you to be a part of something bigger than yourself. And one of the things we've tried to do as a church is prove that year in and year out. And this month is a big, huge part of that. Literally every dime you give, you can see it go right out the door. And you can see the change that happens in our community. You'll be able to see it face to face. You'll be able to walk the streets with it on, you know, next Sunday. You'll be able to experience it in some of these incredible nonprofits that we're going to be able to invest in over this next, you know, few months. That you're going to see this tangibly, what God can do when you will trust him. And to me, that's the most, that's the greatest benefit for us as individuals to this whole idea of Together for Tuscaloosa. Now, don't get me wrong, it's going to make our community better, and it's going to be awesome, and you're going to get to see God do great and amazing and incredible things like he does every single year. But you as an individual can be a part of that and realize that life is bigger than you. And when you feel that, there's going to be a weight lifted off your shoulders and you're going to feel like your heart is in the right spot. And if you haven't experienced that before, I can't wait for you to do that. I can't wait for you to have that. Now, hesitancy aside, right, there's a story that Paul tells. And it's kind of an odd story. Um, and in fact, it, 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 it you know, kind of um, grates me a little bit every time I read it because um, Paul was having a conversation with people. It was the second letter that he'd sent them. So what the, the, the context for this is Paul had been in Macedonia, and he had experienced great poverty. There had been people there that were really struggling. There had been a famine. There had been um, difficulties that, that had come around, upon them that they weren't expecting. People were struggling for money. They were struggling for food. And Paul had reached out to his other churches that he'd been to before, the ones he'd planted, the people he knew, and said, hey, can you do something to help Macedonia? And so interestingly enough, the, the church in Corinth, the Corinthian church, was the very first one to go, hey, we're going to do something, right? And all this is recorded in the book of Acts. We're in. You just tell us what to do. And so uh, several weeks went by, and, uh, and then it was time for Paul to send someone to retrieve this gift that was going to be given. And all of a sudden they were like, uh, I'm not really sure. You know, it's, things have changed, and my heart feels a little bit different today than it did maybe two weeks ago. And I felt this burning passion before, but now I may not feel that burning passion. Uh, and so this is kind of how giving works for us sometimes. Right? I think for me personally, when it comes to generosity, I try to be really intentional that when God lays it on my heart, I do it immediately because I will talk myself out of it over the next five, six hours if I don't. Maybe you're that way too. That when God comes upon me and says, hey, I've given you this, this time, I've given you this money, I've given you this resource, I've given you this skill, I need you to put it to use in my kingdom. If I do it right then and there, <laughs> I'll experience that great blessing. But if I give myself some time to think about it, Sometimes I'll talk myself out of it. And the Corinthians were sitting in that. They were, they were wrestling with, with talking themselves out of being generous. And maybe you find yourself there too. You knew this was coming. This, this month comes around every year. And maybe like at first you're really excited, but now you're a little bit more hesitant. And you're like, oh, can God do that? And what about the economy? And, you know, what will actually happen? And, and Paul has this interesting word for all of us that might be sitting in that feeling. I don't want to read it to you. I'm just, I'm just going to read this and I'll explain the story. He says this. 
Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. For, for those of you that didn't grow up on a farm, if you take a bunch of seed and you scatter it on the ground, the more seed you put on the ground, the more plants you end up with. That's what he's referring to. And the, le- the less seed you put on the ground, the less plants you end up with. So whatever you do, there's an exact correlation between how much you put in, right? You'll get out of this what you put in it. We say that kind of thing all the time. And so he says, each of you then, each of you should give what you have decided in your heart. Not reluctantly, or not under compulsion. For God loves a cheerful giver. My favorite commentary, my favorite commentary that I'll read with every message I put together, says this is a um, self-forgetful lover. That's what cheerful giver means. A self-forgetful lover. And, and w- in other words, someone who's, who's so willing to put themselves aside, they go, God, what do you have for me to do for your people today? God loves that, is, is essentially what Paul is saying. And I love this part up here at the top. You should do what you've decided to do in your heart. Not reluctantly, like, I'm not really sure, or, you know, will God be who God is? God is always God. God is always faithful, and he will always be faithful. And he'll always take what you're willing to give him and use it for great purpose. And not reluctantly, or under compulsion, right? Not that somebody's forcing you to do anything either. That, that, that you, you feel like, oh, well, I'm being coerced. No, God loves it when we're willing to go, God, what would you have me do with what I have? What would you have me do with what I have? And so in other words, generosity done cheerfully is not about fulfilling some sort of obligation. It's not about going, okay, God, I checked the box today. I hope, I hope you see this. <laughs> God, see, I'm, it's hurting. I'm putting it in the basket. There it goes. It's not about fulfilling some sort of obligation. No, it, it's about trusting God. It's about trusting God with the end results. It's about trusting God with the end results. God, you said do this. I don't quite know how it's all going to work out, but I know you're God, and I know I'm not, and so I, I will trust you with what happens next, with, with what I give and with me, with what I, I'm willing to part with and, and with me, that you, you got are in charge of me, and you're in charge of that, and you're in charge of all the situations and all the situations of, or all the circumstances, and I'm just going to trust you in the midst of this. God loves it when we're willing to do this. He loves it when we're willing to do this. Now, Again, because I'm a person, and I'm a human being, and I'm, I'm fairly practical, I know this is not a behavior that's completely normal for all of us. For some of us, this comes as second nature. We could do it blind. But for others of us, we have to think about this, and we have to wrestle with it. It's not a default setting. It's something we have to decide up front. God, I know that I'm giving today, that, that the, the finance, the money that I'm going to put in your hands is not about me. It's not about, you know, um, what I think I can do or what I shouldn't do. It's about trusting you, and I've decided to trust you and see what you will do. And here's the great thing, and, and I, I can't prove this to you. You just have to see it as God does. Every time we do this, God does great things. Every time we do this, God does great things. In the last year, um, and, and really, I'll just I'll give you the grand total again. If, if, our, if, if our giving comes in the way that I think it does this month, um, then we will, uh, we will, by the end of October, cross the giving $100,000 away over the past four years mark to our community. Uh, tell me what other church of about 300 has done that. That's pretty incredible. Now, what have you done with that? Well, let's, let's see. Let's, let's just start tallying some things up. Okay, we've, we've done inv- incredible work investing in One Mission, which is a homeless outreach center that's here in our community. We give to them almost every month. Genesis, um, which is our uh, recovery, it's a recovery ministry that exists in our community. We give to them every single month. They've done incredible things. Some of the graduations recently, I've literally been in tears watching people who the chains of addiction have been broken off of them because of your generosity. Uh, what are, our investment in Baby Steps, which is this incredible support of single mother college students here in our community. Uh, your investment in schools. We've been able to support nearly every teacher in the, in, in elementary school teacher in the county school system over the past four years with some sort of thank you gift or some sort of you've got this gift. We were able to show up at Holt Elementary School two years ago and put on a summer school program that would not have existed without your generosity. Kids who would have no place to go and no opportunity to be able to be blessed by that, no, no opportunity to be able to do anything else but just go home and sit while their parents were at work. We gave that opportunity. You, you guys financed that. Some of our volunteers showed up for the graduation of that with bouncies and ices and all sorts of stuff. We showed up at Rock Quarry and helped them redo all their landscaping, make the school look better for when the kids come in. We gave every first responder in the entire county a thank you card and a gift card just to say, hey, we love you for what you're doing. Thanks for being awesome. You guys did that. Every first responder in the entire county. This year, we have the opportunity to support 
80 preschool teachers, 80 preschool teachers to the city and county school system in our community with just a thank you box to say, look, it's hard. Thanks for wrangling all these two-year-olds and not pulling your hair out. You're awesome. We've invested in the food bank. We've invested in, in Brookwood High School that, that, raises, uh, um, uh, that, that raises plants, grows plants that are given to the food, is given away to students and families that don't have any food. You guys have done incredible stuff. To God be the glory, right? Like, at the end of the day, it's not about us. You know, we love TCAT and, and, and all that. It's awesome. I love our church. But, but because you were willing to go, okay, God, you win. I, I trust you. What will you do today? God's done some cool stuff. And look, I, I, like, I don't want to keep saying this because it sounds like I'm picking on us, but we're not the biggest church in the county. We're not. I mean, I, we don't really want to be the biggest church in the county. I don't mean that, but like, you're, we're 300 scrappy individuals who just love Jesus, and that's pretty cool. It's really awesome. So what will God do, right? What will God do this year? Well, that's completely up to you. I mean, that's literally the truth. I mean, all of us as staff, we're going to give. We give every year. But it's the collective giving of the people in this room, the people listening to the sound of my voice, and the people in our community that have decided to trust Jesus. That generosity is going to make a huge difference. Wait and see. So let me ask you the question I asked at the beginning in just a little bit different way. What am I building my life? What am I building with my life? And who is it ultimately for? This, this, is what Together for Tuscaloosa is all about. Now, um, here's how we did this whole generosity thing. And this is how we do it every year. I don't know if you knew this process. I feel like it's been a couple of years since I explained this. But back in the summer, starting in the summer, um, Reggie and myself, we started communicating with some of the nonprofits we're partnered with and some of the schools we're partnered with. And we just said, hey, what do you need? And we asked them really two questions. What would make a big difference for you? You put that one over for me. Thank you. What would make a big difference for you? And what would help, make, help you make a big difference? This, this is everything that we ask our nonprofit partners, our school partners. Our, our, you know, when, when we, we you know, reached out to City Hall and said, you know, we got a couple of projects we're doing for the city this year where we're cleaning up some streets. We were like, hey, what would make a big difference? What can we do? What would be valuable? What would make a di big difference in our community? And what would help you make a big difference? And when we go to our nonprofit leaders and the teachers and the principals and the superintendents and the, the city officials and all those people and we ask this question, they dream with us. And what are they dreaming about? They're dreaming about a better community. They're dreaming about a world where the could-bes are, right? Where, where the things that should be have become reality. They're dreaming about how they can do more of what God has built them to do. Now, I don't know, look, the truth is, and, and some of you may or may not know this, not all of our organizations we partner with are deliberately Christian organizations. They're not not Christian. They're just doing something really great in our community. And I know the first year I was here, I caught a little bit of flack because I, I eliminated a lot of our smaller ministries here at our church that were doing some of this stuff. And the reason was, is why would we want to compete? Like, we, we went out and we found the best organizations and the best leaders we could possibly find and said, how can we help you do what you do better? Because you're making a huge difference. And from that, all of our partnerships with nonprofits and our partnerships with schools and our partnerships with the city and the county, all of that came about by dreaming about these two questions. Now, if you think about this, this is how kingdom of God people do kingdom of God work, right? This, this is how you figure out what the kingdom of God work is. God, well, how are you moving in our community? Well, how can I be a part of it? And so this year, this year is no different. It, through your giving and your generosity this year, with the nonprofit partners and the projects we have lined up and all the stuff that's coming up together, we will fund this entire list of stuff. And I'm not going to read it for you. But we, we will be able to fund all of these things. Help nonprofits with operating expenses, which is what nobody ever wants to give to. You know, people want to give to, uh, you know, causes to say, oh, this is going to go directly out to a basket. But nobody wants to think about the fact that they got to pay staff. Or they got to, you know, they got teachers that are struggling and they need some help, whatever, right? That you're going to do all of these things. This is what we're going to be able to do together with your generosity. So here's how it works, especially if you're new. You may have heard of this before. Here's my ask. We're asking for 100% participation. And what I mean by that is that every single person who calls TCAT their church home, we want 100% of you to give something. And here's the promise. We're asking 100% of you to give, and we're going to give 100% of it away. We're asking 100% of you to give, and we're giving 100% of it away. That's the promise. 
That's the ask. So, here's a couple of ways that you can give. Can you go forward for me for a couple of slides? One more. There we go. Here's how this is going to work. In just a minute, I'm going to pray. I'm going to say amen, and I'm, that's it. There's no closing song. There's no, there's no rah-rah or anything like that. This is just that moment where if God's been working on your heart, and it's time for you to be a part of this and, and open up your hands and go, okay, God, I trust you, then here's three ways that you can be a part of what's going on this year. Number one, you can just go in our TCAT app and select the Together for Tuscaloosa Fund. 100%, 100% of what goes in this fund goes right back out into our community. 100% of it, it's a promise. We're not going to keep any of it. It's going to go to fund incredible things in our community. And it's going to go to, to put on programs and change kids' lives and feed people who need it and make sure school teachers have what they need. You can also go to fortuscaloosa.org. You can select on the, the giving thing right there. It'll go directly to the giving page. It's already set up. You just put in your amount. Both of those are online. And then the last one is if you'd rather give in person, um, cash or check or whatever, you put it in the boxes at the back of the doors. They both have little stickers that say Fort Tuscaloosa on it, and everything that goes in that box today will go right back out the door. We count that for our offering. So what will God do this year? It's really up to you. It's really up to, to, to what he's asking you to do and inspiring you to do. And I, I know it's going to be awesome, and I know it's going to be great, and I know it's, it's going to help us do things that we couldn't possibly imagine doing if we just set out to say, let's just try to take this chance. Because God works that way. So, ready? Set? Give. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you so much for these people gathered here today. And um, thank you, Lord, for what you're about to do. I know it's going to be great. I know it's going to be awesome. God, show off in our community this month. Show off in our community this month that we can continue to praise you and honor you for who you are and what you do. And let us see great things because we were willing to be generous. Lord, we love you and we trust you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you all so much. Uh, I can't wait to see. You can sign up for Serve Project.